Deloitte is one of the world's big four accounting firms, and it also has a multi-billion dollar global consulting business. In sum, Deloitte generated revenue of $50 billion last year, and that makes it one of the world's largest professional services firms. Over the last decade, Jonathan Kapolsky had a stellar career running marketing and thought leadership at Deloitte's U.S. consulting business. He also ran the firm's prestigious management journal, Deloitte Review, which is now known as Deloitte Insights. Jonathan was instrumental in helping Deloitte raise its thought leadership game early in the 2010s. He started that initiative with conducting interviews outside of Deloitte, interviews with senior executives who consume thought leadership content to better understand what they were looking for in terms of quality content and how they wanted to view it. In fact, in my previous firm, Bloom Group, I was involved in conducting that research on behalf of Deloitte. In our interview, Jonathan will explain how he and his colleagues got the leadership team at Deloitte's U.S. consulting business aligned on how to improve the firm's thought leadership content, as well as how to bring it to market. Now, Jonathan's career began long before Deloitte, and he had a 20-year career at Deloitte, which began in 1997. But five years prior to that, he began running marketing and sales at Commerce Clearinghouse, a provider of business information. His work at CCH helped that firm sell itself to Walters Kluwer for a premium in 1997. And prior to CCH, Jonathan worked at Booz & Company, the management consulting firm, where over seven years, he helped the firm establish its media and entertainment consulting practice. Since Jonathan retired from Deloitte in 2017, he's kept very busy. He's been program director at Northwestern University's business school, the Kellogg School, and he's worked in their executive education program where he's been updating their course content in business marketing strategy. And since 2020, he's been an executive director at Northwestern University's journalism school, the Medill School. At its Beagle Research Center, he's been determining the research agenda for the Digital Marketing Center of Excellence, and they have been conducting studies since then on B2B content marketing. So for everyone who plays a role in their organization's thought leadership content and the marketing of that content, I think you'll learn a lot from this interview and from Jonathan's success at Deloitte and afterwards. Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning, Bob. Delighted to be with you today. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you. So we're going to talk about 40 minutes about your career in marketing and thought leadership, uh, especially at Deloitte, where you had uh, numerous, numerous accomplishments and helped Deloitte raise its eminence, its stature, its um, the way people, executives around the world look at the company to, to raise its thought leadership credentials. And so a number of the questions are about that. You know, how did you help and your colleagues at Deloitte, how did you guys accomplish that? And then I'd like to get into, uh, you've done a lot of teaching, uh, I guess, uh, since Deloitte, Northwestern, and your views on thought leadership as a career and, you know, what's going on in the university uh, world to prepare the next wave of people in this profession? I guess if we can call it a profession, um, maybe that should be a question. Is this a profession yet or what? And what is a profession? Absolutely. Happy to be here and uh, wherever you'd like me to start. So your career in running marketing and thought leadership uh, was from roughly 2011 to 2017, so six years, seven years. When you look at the, why don't you describe the picture, uh, you know, when you arrived in that position at Deloitte, you had been there a few years uh, prior to that at Deloitte. Paint us the picture of the condition of thought leadership at Deloitte roughly around 2011 and what you were asked to do and then what you did do. Sure. And just kind of by way of background, so I've had a career which has been split between executive positions in marketing and technology, as well as positions as a strategic marketing consultant. And I came to Deloitte in um, 1997 after being the uh, chief marketing and sales officer for a professional publishing company. So I had a background in media and publishing. Uh, everything from running printing plants to you know how to get high quality electronic publications out to our 
professional audience, which at that time was lawyers, accountants, healthcare professionals, and so forth. And I joined Deloitte uh, primarily to focus on providing strategic marketing services to our clients. But along the way, I was very involved in creating thought leadership. We called it eminence, which I always found to be a funny term, but it kind of grew on me. And um, I was involved in creating thought leadership of eminence for my own practice, really try to credentialize us as a provider of marketing strategy services. We were well known for what we did on the technology side. And I think around 2010 or so, our chief strategy officer, Mumtaz Ahmed, launched a project really to think about thought leadership at the firm. When I talk about the firm, uh, some people know Deloitte because it's an accounting firm, some people because of consulting, some because of tax and other things. But it was a fairly diverse firm with four major lines of business. And Mumtaz really wanted to look at across all lines of those businesses. Deloitte is one of the world's big four accounting firms, along with KPMG, ENY, and PwC. Deloitte's revenue in 2021 was $50 billion. All four of the big four firms have substantial consulting businesses as well, in addition to their audit, risk, tax, and financial advisory businesses. Deloitte's U.S. revenue was $23 billion last year, about 45% of the firm's total global revenue. And of that $23 billion in revenue in the U.S., more than half of it came from consulting services. And what's the role of leadership in driving growth for us? And so looked at this as an opportunity to grow the revenue base of the firm and continue to credentialize us in new products, new services, and so forth. So there was a long uh, project. I served as the representative of consulting on the steering committee. You and your firm were involved in doing some research with some of our potential clients. And what we concluded was that we believed, and this was important, we believed uh, that thought leadership was critical to the future of the firm. And we also believed that there were some significant opportunities for us to improve. Was that, um, how important was that uh, customer input, you know, the executives who either did buy Deloitte services at the time or could buy, uh, were buying other professional services, firm services. How important was getting that, you know, market feedback to getting the right people at Deloitte to think about this differently? Yeah, I, I think fairly important. So thank you to you and your colleagues for helping us with that. Uh, And we did some interviews, as you know, and we did some quantitative surveys, but it was really trying to understand, you know, how important is this in the various stages of the decision-making process from, you know, what, as a marketer, I call top of the funnel to actually close sales. And it was was a little bit hard for us to understand, did this really matter? Uh, Mm -hmm. We saw other firms doing thought leadership from McKinsey to BCG to Bain. Uh, as well as the other accounting-based firms like KPMG and PwC. And we sort of, you know, there's a lot of skepticism within the firm of was this really worth for us to do, or was it simply kind of vanity publishing? And we concluded based on the feedback from the marketplace, yes, it was important for us to do. Then how did you go about looking at um, what was being done and what was good and what needed to be improved? Yeah, I I would say, Bob, that um, what we had was, um, uh, and and somebody called this, gems amid an avalanche. We (laughs) had a number of very good pieces of thought leadership. And then we had a lot of stuff that was not so good. And so our problem that we had was uh, quantity um, overcame quality. And so what it was pretty hard. We were publishing close to 3,000 pieces a year. These could be PDFs, they could be videos, they could be podcasts. And, and it was just hard to kind of discern and pick out, much less get attention in terms of providing the marketing push to make sure that people were aware of these things. So uh, job number one became how do we focus on the high quality pieces and how do we make quality kind of a you know, something which was embedded in everything that we did from a thought leadership perspective. How did you, with almost 3,000 pieces a year being published, how did you, um, and to focus on the high quality pieces, 
That meant saying no to a bunch of people who in the past had a green light to publish, right? Yeah, you know, it was an interesting time because, you know, if we go back to 2010, 2011, I took on the role in 2011. What happened was after we finished this project, uh, I had volunteered to Mumtaz. I'm happy to help. And the next thing I knew, I was appointed as managing partner for our thought leadership program. And, uh, you know, be careful what you volunteer for. <laughs> but I, I was delighted to do it. And I was flattered to be asked to do that as well. What, what had happened, remember, 2007 was when the iPhone came out, you know, by 2010, 2011, everybody had web pages and so forth. And sort of the default thing that had emerged for us was when in doubt, publish. And so our web page and our website became kind of anytime somebody wrote something, as long as it was not offensive to potential clients, as long as it was passed through a risk review process, we published it. And so it just became sort of the, um, I'll say dumping ground or it became a collection point and so forth. You know, we did a little bit of curation, but not a lot. And, you know, quality often was, we were in some way sabotaging our own quality because we had a fairly rigorous risk review process. So the process neutered some of the more provocative, forward-looking statements that we might make because, God forbid, we should say something that somebody might disagree with. So the, it, we always kind of erred on the side of being conservative. And when we said, this will happen, I wish we did people said, well, this might happen under the following circumstances. When we would say, you know, here's what the future looks like. Here's what the future might look like, perhaps. And, uh, you know, the com combination of equivocation and those kinds of words weakened much of what we did. So even when we did have some quality insights, they became neutered for that by that process too. So your question was, so what did we do? And I'd say it was an integrated program along a couple of dimensions. And one was that we actually made an effort to define what quality was. The quality standards that Jonathan is referring to in my book, Competing on Thought Leadership, are relevance, novelty, depth, feasibility, evidence, illumination, irrefutability, clarity, and stimulation. Those hallmarks or criteria are what sets exceptional thought leadership content apart from run-of-the-mill content. <laughs> and uh, we came up with a set of quality standards. And you talk about this in your book, Competing on Thought Leadership, which is an excellent book. And we said, uh, you know, let, let's really define what the elements of quality were. So some of the elements, because we actually created um, you know, the military has something called challenge coins. Uh, individuals who command have a particular command, they create these metallic coins. And I, I don't know if we can actually see this here, but I've got this little challenge coin that we made, and we had the four quality um, elements. And, and you have some very similar ones in your book. The first one was novelty. Are we actually saying something new? And, you know, what, what we were discovering was, I think we published a lot of things which were, I'll call kind of placeholders. Oh, Deloitte does accounting. Let's have something about what we do on the audit and accounting side. So we really want something which was a new perspective on a new issue or an, a different perspective on a long-term standing issue. Um, the second quality standard was validity. And was the validity was do we have actual data for this? And the data could be data from client work. It could be data from surveys. It could be data from analytics that we had done on, on publicly available data. But is there something to support other than this is what I think? And while opinion pieces have a role in thought leadership, too many of our pieces were really you know, people's point of view and people's you know, gut as opposed to uh, rigorous data analysis. Uh, the third one was utility. And utility was the question about could somebody actually do something based on what they read in our thought leadership, and preferably without help, but could they take some action? So was there an action pragmatic orientation towards this? And then the fourth one was voice. And did we have a distinctive voice that was a Deloitte voice, which pulled together things across it in the same way as 
brands are looking to have a voice. So if you're at an Anheuser-Busch or a Pepsi, you want what that company says to have some kind of internal consistency. So we tried to create a Deloitte voice as well. So those became the four quality standards. Now, put together with that, we also set up a process for how we would review things. And we deferred to a process that we had actually created for an internal magazine called Deloitte uh, Review. And it was basically what universities did, which was a pure review process. So we identified who were some of the best authors in the firm and asked if they would serve as quality reviewers. And then we had this blind process where articles or pieces or uh, concepts went through that process. And as part of that process, they would get feedback. And our goal was not to stop publishing. It was to make sure we didn't publish things that were not of high quality. So the, I said the bias for these uh, reviewers was to get them to give useful feedback that would make something high quality as opposed to just kind of saying, no, you can't possibly publish it. And it was meant to be helpful and intentional as opposed to restrictive. The publication that Jonathan is referring to, Deloitte Review, began publishing in 2008. Since then, Deloitte has published 28 issues. It rebranded Deloitte Review as Deloitte Insights in 2021. And was there any uh, pushback at first, especially from higher places at Deloitte, uh, people who were used to, who, who liked to write, who published often and prior to this, and who said, wait, 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 wait a second, uh, you've just given, in so many words, you've given me such a high hurdle, you know, you're discouraging me from publishing, I don't like it. Did you get any of that, not mentioning names or anything, you got that, how did you address that? Well, we did, you know, any kind of change. I, I think we had a couple of benches. One, one was that the CEO, Joe Echeverry at the time, was completely in support of this. And Mumtaz Ahmed, who was my boss, the chief strategy officer, clearly had uh, Joe's attention, energy, and focus on this. And, and we did spend, and I and Mumtaz spent some time with our management committee and our board really trying to explain what the strategy was. So I'd say that it was a fair amount of top-down buying and said, this is important to the future of the firm. We need to do this right. And um, you know, I, I, and I was a reasonably senior partner too. So I think I had established some bona fides with individuals within the firm as opposed to, you know, and, and you talk about this in the book, as opposed to being a marketing guy who somehow gets inserted in that line. So I had some credentials. I had just published a book at the time, and got, which was published by Paul Gray McMillan, a fairly large press. I'd written a number of articles for journals. And so I think I had some respect and a gravitas, if you will, that helped as well. So if, it, if, it, if you hadn't had the backing of Joe, the CEO, Joe Echeverria, and Muntaz, the chief strategy officer, if you hadn't had, and, and the rest you know, of the management team, if you hadn't had their backing, do you think you would have had a lot more pushback from authors who were used to seeing their stuff sail through the uh, publication process? Would you have gotten a lot more resistance uh, of the type of, who's this guy telling me that my article's not good enough? For what, yeah. what? Oh, I'm sure we would have. But you know, the other thing that we did, Bob, so there was a certain amount of stick, but there was also a carrot. Mm -hmm. And so the carrot part of this was we said, yeah, you know, we're going to re-engineer the whole review process. So typically what had happened was somebody wrote an article and then it went to risk review and risk review kind of emasculated or weigh all the provocative and thoughtful things. And we spent some time with our general counsel, with the risk review team and said, okay, let's really understand what we're trying to do and what are risky things or not. And now let's train our reviewers, the ones who have this approval, who were um, our editorial board, if you will, in the risk review process. And let's engineer that risk review from the get-go. So in order to write something, somebody had to put together a proposal. We went through the proposal and so forth. And you know, I compare how we used to do it as equivalent to building a car. And at the end of the assembly line, then we do an inspection. And we said, let's you know, put risk and quality review throughout the entire stage which then actually meant that it, it, instead of delaying the process, it actually speeded up the process because 
we didn't have to wait till the end and all of a sudden there was this delay. The second thing is we said, you know, we're only going to put marketing dollars against things that go through this process. So if you want to publish something and you want to take it, you know, through risk review yourself and you want to publish it yourself and so forth, we're not going to put any effort against it. So in order to get marketing support, marketing effort, it has to go through this process. That was a, a, the, another part of the carrot. The third thing is that we actually created a destination uh, because it had been our website and we, we built a separate website and a brand and the brand was called Deloitte University Press. Subsequently changed its name to Deloitte Insights. And we had a logo, we had a visual identity and we really started to say, we're, we're like, we need to think like a publisher and a publishing house and create this destination. So if it was on Deloitte University Press, there was a certain cachet associated with it. And I mentioned these challenge points. Actually, for anybody who publishes, I gave them a challenge point. And the challenge point had a logo, you know, press, it had our quality standards. And it said, in recognition of your contribution to Deloitte eminence. And actually, each one of these things was numbered. So you could see where you are. Now, I saved number one for myself. <laughs> uh, but it was also kind of a cute thing. And, you know, I would send them with a little bit of note and uh, and people appreciate that. They must have felt good about it. I mean, internal recognition, uh, uh, even of that type, you know, someone might say, well, that's just token appreciation, you know. But to me, in my experience, that counts. You know, every bit of positive feedback you can give where it's deserved um, can, can, can have an impact. We, we also got lucky. Um, because when we had done the work initially to assess our thought leadership, there was a uh, outside firm called The Source, and The Source uh, rated thought leadership among professional services firms. So at the start of this, we were number 18 on their list. And I think there were like 25 or 30 firms on the list. So we were pretty far down. And so there was a certain kind of imperative and we spent some time talking with the people at the source to understand how they did the ratings. It was very consistent in terms of our way we were thinking about quality. So that became sort of our external benchmark. And over a period of about three years, we went from 18 to one. Wow. And um, that was a good you know, thing for me to share with our management committee and the executive committee of look how we're progressing. There's some external recognition of this. And at the same time, we were starting to get feedback from clients as well about, oh, I just read your piece on X or Y or Z. And so the combination of you know, top management support, these quality standards, the revised, re-engineered quality process, the um, building of this publishing brand, and then this external validation of what we're doing all kind of came together in a uh, magical way. Uh, I, take credit for some of it, but we had a great team. And like I said, I could not have done it without the senior management support and endorsement of the importance of this. Yeah, excellent. When um, you talk about the impact with clients, you know, clients reaching out, uh, more clients reaching out after receiving um, various pieces of thought leadership. Uh, did you, did you, did anybody measure uh, they were trying to measure the impact on ultimately, of course, on revenue or on leads, leads, you know, quality leads, however the metrics are. Did you folks measure uh, the impact of thought leadership, you know, after and before, before you put the content quality and other standards in place? You know, uh, Yes. And I'd say, you know, that evolved over the course of the time that I was in that role, because initially we were looking very much at activity measures, you know, how many people read the thing, how many long did they spend on it, what did they look at and so forth. And we, had, we were going through a process of um, putting in a whole new web platform. So we moved to Adobe Engagement Experience uh, Manager. And so the Adobe platform gave us a lot more data about sort of engagement and activity and so forth. Here, Jonathan was talking about the Adobe Experience Manager. The Experience Manager is a content management system that can create a personalized experience for each and every viewer. But, you know, it, it's 
I, I believe. The world in which somebody's going to pick up a piece of thought leadership and say, oh, I never thought about that before. I've got to call Deloitte and I've got to hire them to do a project. That doesn't really happen. And particularly the strategy for Deloitte, most of the big firms, is there's a portfolio of clients. And here are the big clients who provide most of the work. So it's more about helping those big clients understand either that we, Deloitte, had a new perspective on issue, or maybe we had a set of services that they didn't quite realize. So we evolved over time. We actually launched a project, not coincidentally with Northwestern, where I currently teach. And what we asked Northwestern to look at was, we want to understand the growth among these big clients. We want to understand how many opportunities we had. We want to understand um, how, how many of these opportunities did we win. And we start to look at all those outcome variables, growth, um, proposal opportunities, proposal win rates, and so forth. And we said, let's look at the diversity of marketing activities that they engage with us on. Do they come to our workshops? Do they participate in um, a webinar? Do they read our thought leadership and so forth? And let's see whether or not those factors are influential. So we basically ingested a uh, huge amount of data over a period of time. And what we learned was that the um, engagement with our thought leadership was in fact a significant variable in helping us to uh, grow the relationships with clients. And coming out of that, uh, what's still working on this, develop what we call a client engagement index. And the client engagement index is really supposed to look at not just thought leadership, but other kinds of marketing activities. How do people engage with us? And it became sort of an early indication, potentially, that people were interested in a topic. So they're reading all this stuff about the future of mobility. Aha, uh -huh, maybe we should go and talk to them about it because we may not have been aware of it. So it became a tool for account teams, particularly in the world of account-based management. And it, at the same time, it also became an indicator of maybe lagging interest because they're not looking at our stuff. So maybe we need to be talking about them. So I, I'd say, you know, I, I'm not a believer in straight line attribution of create something, sell a project, but that it's a contributor, particularly in a world in which you're building these big, large, long-term sustainable client relationships. So at some point, do you think when a company has been, you know, Deloitte, uh, McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, Bain, when it seems like the folks at the top are convinced we need to do thought leadership. Let's, you know, is there a point where you think they should st stop trying to measure whether this is having any impact on the top and bottom line? Do you, do you think at some point it's just not worth continuing to try to prove that? You know, let, let's move on and measure something else, maybe? No, no. I mean, so just to be clear, Bob, I, I believe it's good to measure activity, like how people open it, how many people read, what they read, how did, where they spend the time. And, and in part, that's to help around the whole question of topic selection. It's also to help us understand which pieces tend to generate a lot of interest and understand why. So from an editorial policy and so forth, those are all good things to do. I also believe that it's important to understand the role of thought leadership as contributing to the development of a relationship. Because if you've got, making this up, 200 clients who are the disproportionate share of your portfolio, what you want to understand is how are they participating in all the different thought leadership, marketing, sales programs. And for, as a sales team, now I can understand what levers we're pulling. So I think it's important to measure. I think what is a mistake is to try to put a single line of sight attribution metric, because I, I think that not the way that the sales and marketing process works with these major accounts, where it's, these are pieces, but you definitely understand need to understand the contribution to the totality that thought leadership has. So I, I think it's more important than ever to understand types of engagement that clients have with your thought leadership uh, because that's where your future revenues are. Okay, um, let's look ahead. Let's look at this decade. Um, if, I, 
if you were running thought leadership at a big professional services firm or even at a uh, other B2B firm that has discovered thought leadership and said, we need to do this. And by the way, uh, you probably see the same thing I've seen, which is thought leadership has spread way beyond the consulting and accounting yeah. industries, right? Software companies, private equity firms. Uh, I just saw an ad yesterday from BlackRock looking for a thought leadership manager or something uh, to um, venture capital firms. I wrote last week with a couple of professors about Andreessen Horowitz and their thought leadership um, strategy and activities. And so this little activity that you and I, you know, had been doing for many years within consulting firms has been discovered, right? Our island has been discovered. Um, but so if you were running thought leadership and marketing at a, at a big B2B firm, what would you do differently that you might not have done during the last decade? You know, what, what has changed in what, uh, around in the environment of thought leadership and uh, what needs to be run differently, if anything? Well, I think there, it's still, you know, having a publishing mindset, having, you know, quality standards, having a publishing process and thought leadership, those are still kind of like table stakes, if not, uh, more important now than ever before. Um, you know, the other thing that we did, which I think is more important than ever before, is we have this mantra of uh, collaboration. So we partnered with a number of outside organizations, including MIT, both the MIT Media Lab and the MIT Sloan Management Review. And in a world in which, in B2B, ecosystems are increasingly important for delivery, I think figuring out what the pattern is, because when Deloitte delivers cloud services now with Deloitte with Google, Deloitte with Microsoft, or Deloitte with Amazon, so thinking about how your partners and you work on thought leadership is now more important than ever before, because it's not just one firm, it's that ecosystem of value delivery partners. But I think the biggest issue then and now is I'll call it topic selection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you just talked about this a bit in your book. It probably has, I'm making this up again, but over a thousand discrete services and so forth. And each one of those has a partner or managing director responsible for that, who's raising her or his hand saying, I need some thought leadership. And the challenge is you can't do justice to a thousand different things. And you need to find what are the big rock that you can stand on. I guess this, it was Archimedes or something who said, you know, if I give me a place to stand and I could move the world. So what are those big rocks? We refer to it at Deloitte as big idea campaigns, but what's a theme in which many of our services can play a part, but it's less about, you know, aligning thought leadership with a particular product line. And I think that's more important than ever because you can only do so much. So we, we experimented before Deloitte on a global basis with what we call the future mobility. And this would include vehicles, would include shared vehicles and other types of programs. And it had impact on real estate, had impact on healthcare and insurance, a bunch of other things. And a bunch of our services could see themselves in that big idea. Mm -hmm. But you can only do so many big ideas. And as I was leaving, one of my colleagues who was looking at this report for consulting said, oh, yeah, we've identified our big ideas. We've got 20 of them. <laughs> Tried to politely say, I think that's about 18 too many. <laughs> so I, I think that's more relevant. But the other thing, Bob, uh, which continues to change now versus then, is we continue to have a variety of modalities. Um, virtual reality. How can we use that? I think um, I saw probably maybe about a year ago or so, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers is doing something interesting with using virtual reality uh, headsets to deliver what I would call thought leadership. You know, podcasts now are kind of established, but a couple of years ago, those were new and novel. You know, uh, increasingly, there are tools for large-scale data visualization that become important. So I think keeping up with the technologies which help people to engage with thought leadership is now more important than ever before. 
The other thing I think is probably more important than ever before is that we've got better tools for personalization. How do we you know, dynamically create content that's relevant to individual targets? The CFO at a pharmaceutical firm may want something very different than the chief HR officer at consumer packaged goods company. How do we think about taking thought leadership and personalizing, not just saying, dear Bob, here's something that you might be interested in, but where the content actually reflects your interest as well. And then, you know, how do we give better opportunities for interaction? And um, we know that if people have a chance to comment, that's good. If we know people have a chance to review things, that's good. So how do we engage clients in terms of interacting, potentially co-creating thought leadership and so forth? So I'd say topic selection, more important than ever before, Focus on ideas that you can own, uh, having the right kind of technologies for delivering this thing, figuring out ways to personalize, and then thinking about creative ways to engage uh, through the use of technology and other platforms. Interesting. Let's go back uh, quickly to the virtual reality uh, topic that you, you discussed, uh, especially given all the conjecture about the metaverse and you know all this, which I'm still trying to sort through. <laughs> but um, you and everybody else, right? I guess that we're all in the same boat here. Is uh, you know, hopefully somebody will crystallize exactly what it is and and what the impact is. But on the on virtual reality, do you see an application in thought leadership for events? For you know, we used to call them marketing events. They we would speak at somebody's conference, or we'd run our own seminars and conferences or webinars. Is there a virtual reality play in? thought leadership events where we're presenting and listening to clients and showing them how smart we are? So I think so, but I don't know so. (laughs) uh, One of the other things that we did at Deloitte, and I'm a big believer in, is testing and learning and figuring out ways to uh, try something out without like betting the farm on it. So for instance, we had... um, Back, this was probably around 2012 or so, uh, one of my colleagues had published a report for internal purposes about the growth of massive open online courses, MOOCs. And I thought it was kind of interesting. And I had this idea, maybe we, Deloitte, should create a MOOC. So I went back to this guy and I said, how much would it cost us to develop like a high quality MOOC? And we, we determined that we could do something for under $100,000, which for Deloitte is a lot of money, but well within the affordability dimension. I said, okay, let's do it. And we picked the topic of the internet of things because that we thought it was a very relevant topic. We partnered with a couple of different organizations to do it. We have to have somebody on our team who was a former business school professor at Marquette University, and we did this MOOC. And we had 15,000 people who signed up for and completed the MOOC end to end. Each one of those people who went through the MOOC spent on average about five hours with the MOOC. Wow. Now, time. Would, would have been great to have a million people? Absolutely. But five hours and 15,000, that's gold. And, you know, talk about client engagement, they were engaged and so forth. And somebody would say, well, why do you do it? We said, because what we want to do is to demonstrate the credibility of Deloitte, that we have the capabilities and my thought leadership so that when you're wrestling with problems around the Internet of Things, we can be a valuable journey part for you. So we decided to do a couple of other moves. And then, so point is with virtual reality, if I were, in that role now, it's a what, how can we come up with an experiment to see if it works or not and test it and what kind of value do we get from it? Because my hypothesis is that's important, but I might be wrong. And it would be the first time I was wrong. So do some experiment that give us the opportunity to test and learn. Yeah, in fact, I've thought about um, this a little bit uh, to the degree that it's dangerous thinking, but. Uh... You know, it's in seminars, the, the typical thought leadership technique is for the presenter, whether Deloitte or whomever, to give to give case study stories, right? You know, here's how we solve this problem at this auto manufacturers in, in you know, this manufacturing plant. So virtual reality could bring those webinar or seminar viewers into the plant where the 
presenter is saying, here was the problem over here. See this, this piece of this, the assembly line, we had to do this over here and that over here. And the audience is drawn into the environment that the presenter is talking about, as opposed to just hearing from the presenter, you know, uh, in a third degree of here's what we did at General Motors manufacturing facility. So I'm with you 100%. It sounds like a good idea to me. But sometimes my good ideas don't quite work out. <laughs> so so I, I would encourage people to say, okay, so let, that it sounds like let's think about doing one. What will we learn from doing one? Let's try it out. Let's test it. Let's see how people react to it and so forth. And, and I could tell you that, you know, as we're living through this period of COVID, a couple of companies outside of professional service firms have started to do that. So General Electric has started to do it with some of its capabilities to bring people into kind of an innovation center. But now the coming into the innovation center is all done virtually. Wow. So I, I do that. I, I believe that there are a lot of opportunities, but um, my big lesson from my time at Deloitte is test, learn, and then scale. Often, you know, firms want to sort of like, let's come up with a big master plan. And yeah, you know, the challenge is figuring out how do we test something in an economical way? How do we learn from that? And then how do we scale quickly? So in these books that I've collaborated with on recently, one of the things that we talk about, how do firms become very good at testing fast, learning fast, and scaling fast? And I think that's very applicable to top leadership as well. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, let's move on to the education topic. Since you have been teaching at uh, Northwestern, and um, do you have thoughts on uh, uh, whether uh, and uh, on thought leadership as a curriculum uh, worthy of universities like Northwestern uh, in in investing some resources in and preparing students uh, today for this profession? Yes. Uh, but let me explain a little. So um, Northwestern, as some of your listeners may know, is one of our Big Ten universities, a, what we call an R1 or top tier research institutions in the country. And uh, we've got some wonderful schools. I'm involved with two schools at uh, Northwestern. One is Kellogg, which is our school of management and one of the top uh, schools of management in the country. The other is Medill, and Medill is a school of journalism, media, integrated marketing, communications. Once again, one of the top journalism, media, integrated marketing programs in the country. And uh, so I, I, at Kellogg, one of the things that I do is I run a program called Business Marketing Strategy, and this is an executive education. And one of the things uh, that you know, I've shared with people, most of the people who come to our program are sort of accidental marketers. <laughs> they didn't you know, wake up one morning and say, I want to go into B2B marketing. It just That's just a, the cold, harsh reality for those of us who have spent a lot of our careers in business marketing. So uh, you know, I, I think we don't see a lot of students you know, in school aspiring to say, how can I be a not only a business business marketer, but somebody focused on thought leadership you know, for B2B firms? Um, and I'm not sure when they're potentially, you know, they get much more excited about an Instagram program that they could run for Kellogg's or for Kraft General Foods or whatever. Is that because they don't, and I thought about this, is that because they don't know about this arcane profession of thought leadership? They don't know about business marketing, unless they don't know about thought leadership. Yeah, they haven't had exposure. And, that, you know, you don't see as nearly as many commercials on the Super Bowl for B2B things as you do for B2C. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Now, what's happening is one big change is the growth of these technology firms. So when you look and say, where increasingly do we see more and more of our graduates going? They go into places like Amazon and Google and so forth. So that's changing kind of the relative appeal of business marketing in general and being B2B firms versus where it was maybe 30 years ago, where the hot thing was consumer packaged goods. And at the same time, the consumer packaged goods companies are all 
you know, either held by private equity firms or kind of declining. So it's kind of hard to do that as well. The second, so that, that's what's happening kind of on the business side. At the same time, it's interesting what's happening on the journalism side because newspapers are going out of business, you know, kind of over there broadcasting. So people who said, you know, I want to be a journalist, you know, are looking at new ways to uh, find a home, you know, with how do I create stories and tell stories and how do I build that? So it's interesting because I increasingly am running into more and more McGill, our journalism school, alums who are working in B2B enterprises around the topic of thought leadership or content marketing or so forth. So the combination of the convergence of these growth of technology firms and the decline of opportunities for journalism is creating an opportunity. So uh, we are starting to see more interest there. We certainly do um, programs in business marketing. We do programs in content marketing and content development and so forth. But I'd say uh, it's still sometimes hard to get students who may be you know, early in their careers to say, hey, that looks like an attractive path. But yet, I'll talk to people who are mid-career uh, and I can think of at least one at Salesforce, and she would say, you know, I never would have expected to be here, but now that I'm here, I look at my work it, to become, you know, earn my master's of science in journalism as pivotal to my ability to be a great marketer and to be involved in our thought leadership and content development. Yeah, and so on that, um, do you think a lot of these students, whether at Northwestern or other um, universities with journalism and, and, and business marketing programs, serious ones, do you think they should increasingly look to the technology uh, sector, the Amazon, Amazon Web Services, the Microsoft, Salesforce.com, as places to practice, to, to seek jobs in thought leadership, as oh, much as uh, consulting sector? Yeah. Consulting, law firms, so forth. Yeah, absolutely. No, so I, but I think uh, there's more of a pull now than there might have been 20 years ago. Yeah, I think it's just one of the great undiscovered professions at the university level. Uh, my alma mater, Penn State, uh, uh, which I've been involved in in a limited way since um, over the last three years, four years, um, um, I think thought leadership was somewhat new to their <laughs> journal school of journalism or uh, college of communications when I uh, mentioned it to folks at the top of the of the college back in um, 2018, I think it was. So, um, so, but it's, it's great to see that they're, and they're interested. And I imagine there's, I hear, I'm hearing there's interest at Northwestern and maybe there's interest in many other places, um, you know, universities around the country or even around the world. Okay, we're heading into the, the home stretch here. We're, we're uh, into the, the last part of the interview. And I wanted to switch topics here. And it's a topic, um, you know, the fourth topic, and it's one prompted by, um, by, by the death of your dear wife, uh, Ellen, uh, in 2021, just a year ago. And, and the fact that you've been so transparent around, um, you know, what's happened um, since that time, uh, which, which I think is, um, I imagine it's caused I'll just talk about myself. Um, it's caused me to rethink what, you know, how would, what would I do if it ever happened to me? And I imagine other people have told you, or if they haven't, are thinking, thinking the same thing of, boy, this is really important stuff to prepare for. Hopefully they never have to prepare for it, but we do know that life uh, travels in a different direction than we all intend. So, um, I, you know, I commend you for being so transparent about, about everything. And um, what do you think is, you know, what would be your advice to others who um, go through this, um, the, the loss of a, a loved one, a, a wife or a husband or a, a child, they're in the midst of a, a, a very successful career, and all of a sudden, this comes out of the blue. What, what's your advice for, for staying sane? for keeping going? Well, it's not something I would have thought about five years ago or even three years ago. And as you say, so my Ellen, 
Beretta, who was my wife for 39 plus years, died April 7, 2021. And um, she was sick for about 17 months before. She died from congestive heart failure as well as some other complications. And up until the time that she was initially diagnosed in November 2019, she was very healthy, uh, 69 year old, who was finishing up her certification to be a Pilates instructor. So it was not something where we had this history of illness or something to kind of prepare for. And I was recently retired from Deloitte, uh, starting my encore career teaching. And all of a sudden this comes along and I don't think you can ever prepare uh, for something like this. It, it just, you never know because everybody's circumstances are different. I, I would say a couple of things that I've learned. I mean, one is long relationships are, um, you know, hopefully things that everybody has in their life with their friendships or romances or so forth. And somebody shared with me a quote and, I, and I'm uh, paraphrase slightly, but you know, somebody dies and you grieve for them and grief is a price we pay for love. And I thought that was a profound thing to hear. And you know, that's the quid pro quo. You love somebody and you grieve for them. Um, I would say one of the things that helped me a lot, and I would recommend this to anybody, is uh, talking with people. I found um, a couple of good colleagues and friends who uh, had lost a spouse. Uh, in one case, it had been relatively uh, long ago. In other cases, it was more recent. And just you know, always use them to kind of test my feelings, understand the issues. You know, there's a range of practical issues, as well as sort of the spiritual, emotional, and so forth. I I'm one of these people who... Um, thinks that by asking and soliciting help, you actually get the help that you need. Um, you know, sometimes you hear stuff that is irrelevant, but there is much more relevant uh, stuff, and it was good to talk about people as well. So uh, the, the big recommendation I give to people is, you know, be you know, through, be the people that you can um, talk to and who are, you know, when you get to my position, how can you help other people going through that? And it takes a while to process. The other thing we wound up doing was really thinking about, so what kind of legacy could we uh, leave for Alan? And um, it, was a, it was an interesting exercise because at, by the time as we started having this conversation, her ability to sort of cognitively trade off some of these was somewhat limited. And um, by happenstance, we... My daughter and I were talking, so she's now 32, but came up with the idea of looking at a program at her undergraduate alma mater, Loyola Marymount, which is out near Los Angeles, and they just started a program in public health. And we got in touch with them, and they were absolutely terrific about coming up with some ideas. And what we ultimately did was decide to fund a research fellowship for undergraduate students who were from underserved populations. And first gen, which was Ellen, because she's uh, is Puerto Rican by background, and she was the first in her family to go to college. And um, it was really give them some opportunities that maybe students in schools like Harvard or Northwestern or Stanford, where we had other affiliations, just aren't going to get. It's been, um, it, it was interesting. I solicited contributions from people and had more than 220 friends and family and relatives and colleagues who donated to this, in addition to a fairly substantial donation that we made. Um, and we established the Ellen Carroll Barreto Research Fellowship in Public Health and Society at Marymount. And they selected wow. first two students uh, this summer, and both fit perfectly as uh, coming from, they're both female, they're both from underserved populations, they're both first gen uh, students. And so, you know, this will be something I've asked my daughter now to kind of manage and something for her as a way to kind of manage her grief with her mom's death and loss. So thinking about that, I mean, we could just donate money to any number of causes, but this was something which was uh, meaningful to my family, as well as something which I thought reflected some of the legacy that Ellen had as well.
Yeah, what a what a wonderful gift um, in her memory. What what a, what a wonderful move. It, it, it's um, I imagine Ellen, if she was alive, would would have looked at this and said, "This is this is a perfect perfect thing to to opportunity to give." You know. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it with her before she died, but how much of that she processed? Yeah. Quite oh, sure. So she knew about it. So she knew about what was going yeah. to happen. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So once again, I would you know, encourage people, you know, look for help, you know, people have held this path before, and also think about this before, you know, instead of waiting until somebody dies. And I'll often see solicitation, people say, well, in their name, you know, give to X college or so forth, it might be to Penn State or something, uh, or Northwestern, but it, the more specific you can make it. And um, I, I would also, I mean, I want to, these 220 individuals who gave money, I mean, it was terrific. I mean, it was quite money that we were able to raise, and then um, we was able to accelerate some of the, the major contributions that me made as well. But um, people who just, people who I knew who didn't necessarily know Ellen, people who knew Ellen, and it was a chance to kind of get back in touch with people um, who we had kind of lost contact with. You know, one of the great things about the internet and email and so forth is you can find people that you thought you had severed connections with and reestablish connection. Did the uh, memorial service for her on Zoom. And I think we had probably about over 200 people come from all over the world. And, um, you know, inadvertently, we intended to do it face to face back in September. We did it on September 11th. And uh, because of the emergence of the virus, we didn't wind up doing it remotely, and it actually turned out to be a beautiful thing. Well, that's wonderful, and uh, there's a link that uh, uh, I'd be happy to share, you know, on, on this. Uh, if you can send me the link, um, I will do that. Jonathan, this has been terrific. Thank you so much for um, for exploring your career, exploring the last couple of years, very difficult years, and uh, and would love to have you back um, uh, and hear if there's another. If there's another um, path in the in the career of Jonathan Kapolsky, uh, you know, or or whether you say that's it, I'm done. I have a feeling that that's not going to happen, but I imagine there's another another step in the journey here. Yeah. So Bob, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for inviting. Thanks for your contribution to this um, profession of thought leadership and professional services. I enjoyed the book and would heartily recommend it to others and uh, look forward to staying connected with you. And certainly if anybody wants to talk about Encore careers and what comes after um, time spent in a corporation, always happy to connect with people. Very good. Thank you, Jonathan. Hearing about how Deloitte took thought leadership to a whole new level under his guidance and the guidance of others back in the beginning of the last decade, Hearing what Jonathan said about how they re-engineered the content review process, how they got the firm to loosen up its uh, overly restrictive policies about what it could say in articles, which has been a key piece in Deloitte's success in publishing better and better thought leadership content. I also found it extremely interesting for Jonathan to talk about his experience in teaching integrated marketing at Northwestern University, in part because I aspire to teach thought leadership at a university level over the next five years. And finally, to hear how Jonathan has dealt with the loss of his beloved wife, Ellen, over the last year has been eye-opening. I hope all of us have the strength that Jonathan Kapolsky has shown in how to deal with the loss of a loved one. Jonathan can be reached at the following email address, jkopolsky at outlook.com. That's J-C-O-P-U-L-S-K-Y at outlook.com. If you'd like more information on the Research Fellowship in Health and Society that Jonathan and his children have established at Loyola Marymount University, you can reach out to Donna Gray at LMU's development office She's at Donna, D-O-N-N-A dot Gray, G-R-A-Y at L-M-U dot E-D-U. Or you can contact Jonathan at jkopolsky at outlook.com. 
On that note, I'll say goodbye and see you on the next episode of Everything Thought Leadership.